Well, pray for me. Two of my bags are still lost with British Airways. They have been lost for seven days. Longer than that. I went to Poland Wednesday last week, not Wednesday gone, the Wednesday before. Poland for three days, Germany for three days. My bags did not turn up and um, they arrived at the hotel in Poland the day after I left. And um, so even right now, they're still, they don't know where my bags are. And so I'm wearing the only clothes I have left in the world today. And um, so, you know, I'll be back to my scruffy jean self next weekend. Hey, next Sunday, we've got Dr. Robbie Sondrega with us back from Australia, clinical psychologist who uh, is amazing, who works with, um, with victims, uh, child victims of war, works a lot in Syria and uh, Afghanistan and things like that. He's going to be sharing with us next week. The guy is an absolute genius. You're going to love him. And also, I'm going to give you a little bit of a sneak peek into our conference that we have coming up in February, our leaders conference. It's called the Culture Summit. Pastors, leaders come from all over the world for that. We have just secured um, Major John Cole, the youngest major Gen, sorry, Major General John Cole, the youngest ever Major General of the British Army, is going to be with us on the Friday and the Saturday, sharing leadership principles. Whenever Britain goes into a crisis situation, his boots are the first on the ground, leading men and women into those situations. He's going to be with us as well into the Sunday, and um, but at the Leaders Conference, he's going to be doing a whole session on leadership, and we're also going to be doing a and a with him as well. So I think that is going to be fantastic. What I want to do right now is I want to kind of preach my way and work my way through this passage that we've just read here about Jesus' encounter with the 10 lepers. Uh, uh, 10 were cleansed. uh, One was really healed, the Bible says. And it starts off in this story. It says, now on his way to Jerusalem. I love this because Jesus was, was always going to something. He was always focused on the next person, the next situation, the next season. Uh, Jesus had an amazing time up until this point. He'd, he'd kind of turned the water into wine. He'd fed 5,000 men plus women plus children with five uh, loaves of bread and, and two fish. Or was it the other way around? Uh, he, he, he'd, 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 he'd calmed storms. He'd done amazing things. And yet here we find Jesus in Luke 17. It says, now on his way to Jerusalem. What's really important for us to understand at the outset of this message is this, is that Jesus knew he was going to Jerusalem to die. Jesus knew he was going to Jerusalem to die. Now, I guess it feels kind of strange in 2018 to think about the concept of a God who would die for His people, a God who would die. This whole concept of God dying comes out of the Old Testament. The Bible, as it's presented to us, has two parts, the Old Testament, the New Testament. The Old Testament has 39 books of the Bible, starts with the book of Genesis and goes all the way through to the book of Malachi, then 27 books in the New Testament, Matthew all the way to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, probably the most confusing book in the Bible for many. And so in the old part of the Bible, it really talks about something called the sacrifice system where God instructed His people, the Jewish people, in in the way that they could be cleansed from their sin. Sin is not so much wrongdoing. Sin is anything we put before God. Anything we prioritize in our life before God, the Bible actually classifies as sin. The first of the 10 commandments is this, you shall have no other God before me. And so in the old part of the Bible, God instructed His people that once a year they would go to the temple, they would sacrifice a lamb or some such thing, and with the shedding of blood, they would be um, forgiven of their sins for that past year. God ultimately, in, in, in His foresight, knew that this, as a system, was not something that, that was going to last the test of time. And so God thought, rather than standing a long way off from my people, from human beings, God came to earth. The Bible says God came as Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He was fully God and fully man. The Bible says that Jesus lived a perfect life. It's really important that we understand that because in the Old Testament sacrificial system, they would have to take a lamb that had no spot, had no blemish. They would take a perfect lamb and that would be sacrificed for the sins of the people. 
Jesus, in coming from heaven, lived a perfect life. He is known in Scripture as the perfect lamb. Jesus came, Jesus lived perfect, and then he allowed them, the Romans, to, to nail him to the cross. And Jesus died on the cross, the Bible teaches us, so that we can live free of the penalty of sin. We all live right now subject to the presence of sin and also the power of sin affects our lives. But ultimately, when we get to heaven, we will be totally free of the presence of sin, the power of sin. And of course, we understand this in Scripture that Jesus died on the cross to free us from the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is eternity without God, eternity without Christ. All of this was going through Jesus' mind when it says here, now on his way to Jerusalem. Now on his way to Jerusalem. And one of the things I want you to get here right now is this, is that Jesus was not so focused on the future that he did not have time for now. Now on his way to Jerusalem. I want you to know across this place right now that for some of you, you've thought, you know what, my healing, my breakthrough, my restoration, my healing in my mind, uh, uh, my, my, my restoration of relationship, the healing in my body is something that will happen at some future point. I want you to be confident of your God this morning that God is not just a future God, your God is also a now God. And there is nothing stopping your God bringing to you the miracle that you need now. God can bring a miracle now. I know that. We have prayer walls that have been filled with prayer requests and praise reports have been coming in of people who kind of decided to lay hold of this now kind of God. God is a now God. Some of you are saying to me, well, Glenn, if God is a now God, why is it that I'm still waiting for my miracle? Why is it that I'm still waiting for my breakthrough? I think the Bible answers this in the next part of the verse. It says this, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee as he was going into the village. He was met by 10 lepers. I want you to note here in Scripture, it's very clear that he walked along a border. He was on the periphery. He was on the outside. In fact, in fact, the Bible word uh, Samaria, it means a watchtower, and Galilee, it means a border or a ring. I want you to see here in Scripture this morning that the miracle did not happen at the periphery. The miracle did not happen on the edges. The Bible says the miracle happened when Jesus went into the village. You see, I believe that sometimes what we can do in our walk with God is this, is, is we can at times keep God at the periphery of circumstances and situations. We can, in a sense, set up a watchtower because we've been disappointed because number one, maybe God hasn't answered our prayer uh, as we thought. Number two, it's taken a while for God to answer prayer. Number three, we've been disappointed maybe in life, maybe in faith. Number four, something's happened in church. We weren't happy with. And so we set up a watchtower and we keep God at the periphery of things. We keep God at the edge of things. But I want you to see here, the key to the miracle was God going into the middle. He went into the village. Folks, miracles are not designed to happen on the periphery. God wants to do a miracle in your life. But what we have to do is let Him in. I said what we had to do is let Him in. You see, we can do it with finances. We can believe God for a miracle, but sometimes we just keep God on the edge of our finances. We can say things like, well, I know better than God. I know how to work things out. I know how to budget. I know how to do these things. I'm going to do my best with what I can do on my own, and I'm not going to do it God's way. I'm going to keep God out on the edge of the miracle I need in my finances, and that's why we wait. We wait because we're not including God in 
the middle. We're not bringing God into the middle. See, that's what our tithes do. Tithes are bringing God into the middle of things. Tithes are our way of saying, God, I don't want you on the periphery of my business. I don't want you on the periphery of my budgeting. I don't want you on the periphery of my savings and investments and holidays. God, I want you in the middle of it because the Bible's pretty clear here that while Jesus walked down the border, not much happened, so he had to go into the middle. Can I just say that with your family, get God in the middle of it. Parents, if you're walking through challenges with your children, get God in the middle of it. If there's challenges in your marriage, get God in the middle of it. We weren't designed to do it alone. We weren't designed to make this up and to grin and to bear it. We weren't designed to have loveless marriages and, and, and families with children, children where we don't really get along. Get God into the middle. Because the Bible says here, when God went into the middle, that's when the miracle took place. Let me ask you a question. Where are you keeping God on the edge? Where are you keeping God on the periphery of things? Can I maybe ask you with your business, where are you keeping God on the periphery of your job and, and, and your business? Have you actually thought maybe about praying in the workplace? But actually saying, God, today is your day. I'm bringing you right into the middle of this situation. Maybe there are challenges with your KPIs and the goals and the financial targets are being set in the workplace. Have you thought for a moment about consistently inviting God into the middle of the breakthrough, into the middle of the miracle? Because the Bible says Jesus went in there and he found 10 men who had leprosy. I love this. 10 men had leprosy. Leprosy was a horrible disease. Still is, still exists to this day, but not as common. I think I've told you once before that a few years ago, Sophie and I were in a part of the world and we went to an area that was known for leprosy and I took a picture of Sophie with an elderly lady. The elderly lady had half of her face eaten away with leprosy. And then my wife was stood next to her and I thought, you know what, the, the, the only difference between my wife and this lady is where they were born. You see, in other parts of the world, leprosy, uh, there, there, there's, 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 there's uh, antivirals, medications, things that we can get. Leprosy back, in, back then was a feared, feared disease. You would do things like lose your, your feeling in your fingers, in your toes, in your nose, in your ears, and, and you would get a cut and not know it, and it would get infected, and slowly parts of your body would, 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 would rot away effectively. It was really, really feared, and so here we have 10 lepers. We know this about the lepers, that lepers lived in colonies outside the towns and cities. They lived in community. They would live there to, to support each other, to protect each other. I can imagine the conversation one day of these lepers, one leper saying, hey, have you heard about this Jesus character? And somebody says, well, what do you mean? What Jesus? Because there's lots of Jesus as well. You know, the one from Nazareth, I've heard a little bit about him. Somebody else pipes up. I heard that, that the Jesus you're talking about, he, he's, he's opened blind eyes. He's, he's, he's healed the deaf. He, I heard that he's actually raised a little girl who was dead back to life. And, and the first leper says, that's the one I'm talking about. And I can imagine somebody saying, yeah, but what's the chance he will ever come here? You ever thought that? What's the chance that God would ever give me this miracle? What's the chance that God would ever help me get that job, that girl, that guy? What's the chance that God could really help me with my mental health? What's the chance that God could really do something with my physical body that has ailments and, and, and sicknesses, and, and you have this sort of dialogue, conversation going around, what's the chances of him coming here? And then the Bible says, there came the moment as Jesus walked into the village, they said this, they stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice. In other words, they didn't care what people thought. They were beyond caring. They just thought, this is the one who can give us the miracle. They decided, we're not gonna play this cool, calm, and collected. We don't care what the people think. Here comes Jesus. And they did something 
not cool. You know what? It doesn't matter what we do with Christian faith. It doesn't matter how we try to, try to contemporize it and do different things. I just want you to know there are elements to Christianity that is just simply not cool. I mean, I mean we, we, can, we can kind of put it, you know, change terminology and things like that. But baptism? Some of you think, like, this is a sacred cow. How dare you talk about baptism? I mean, when you think about it. Look, are you thinking about it? Somebody says yes to Jesus. And in the space of a few weeks, we're saying, hey, got a great idea. We're going to set up a little pool. You're going to sit in there. We're going to dunk. You're going to get wet. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> it's cool when you're in it because we've got no heating. No, no. When you understand what it is, it's cool. But folks, come on. You know, when, when, when you've got baptized and you brought your friends who've never seen a baptism, an adult baptism, and they're talking to you about it, and they're like, yeah, hey, that was cool. They weren't thinking it was cool. I'm thinking that. That's just weird. I mean, you ever thought about worship? Come on, think about it. It's kind of like karaoke, yeah? The only thing we need is a ball bouncing over the words which I'm sure we could produce that for the last song of the day. I'm sure, I'm sure we could. It's kind of, it's kind of, now we get it. We understand it. <laughs> you remember the first time you ever came to church and you saw somebody lift their hands? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, remember the first time you ever came to church and saw somebody jump? Yeah. How about this one? Um, Becky over here, stand up, Becky. Becky, one of Becky's things that she often does with a preacher when she likes the preaching is sometimes she'll stand, but other times she'll just lift her hand. Just sit down for a second, Becky. Lift your hand. That's what you do. Hey, and, and now stand up and lift your hand. Stand up and lift your hand. Yeah. She, she often does that. Now you can sit down again. Did you know a few weeks ago there was somebody in church for the first time who, who kind of c communicated to somebody else and said this, said, um, did, did nobody see the hand going up in church? Uh, if she needed the bathroom, why didn't we just let her go? <laughs> True story. <clears throat> hey, I'll give you a verse that's really not cool. Jesus says this, if somebody strikes your cheek, Offer the other. Modern terminology. When you're in a traffic jam and somebody cuts in front of you, bless them in Jesus' name. Stop rolling down the window and doing that gesture. Like Pastor Mark Foster did. You remember when he told the story about the guy who cut it up? So Mark goes onto the hard shoulder and he's going to the guy, think about it, think about it. And then he realised that the guy who cut him up was a plainclothes policeman in a plainclothes police car. <laughs> You're joking, not cool. Jesus talks about forgiveness. How uncool is that? When you feel justified in that offence, Jesus said, if somebody asks you to walk one mile, don't just walk one mile, walk two. N totally, totally not cool. And, and something happens for a miracle. Something happens when, you, when you're desperate, where, where, where you actually lose sight of what people think. I don't care. You see it with altar calls. Some of us in church are just too cool for school. Others are too school for cool. And when it comes to an altar, it's like, well, what will people think? I'm not too sure. Lifting my hands. Well, I'm not too sure. But when you need a miracle, when you need a miracle, you don't mind coming down to the prayer wall and filling it in when you need a miracle. And I think that, that sometimes we've got to realize that, that, that the journey to the miracle is often not cool. The journey to the miracle often requires something very different to maybe what we thought and what we expected. It says they stood and they called at a, at a distance. They said, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. They spoke the very words that they knew. I don't know how they knew it, but they knew 
that in speaking those words, they were tapping into the very core of our God. He's a God who has pity. He's a God who has compassion. He knows, they knew exactly what to say, just like your children know what to say to you when they know they've done something wrong, but you don't know they've done something wrong, and they're about to confess to you that they've done something wrong, but you don't know that they've done something, and you know that they're up to mischief. You know they're up to something just by the words. Mom, you look beautiful today. <laughs> Dad, have you lost weight? <laughs> what have you done, Jaden? <laughs> Jesus. Master, I want you to notice that, that Jesus speaks, that the name speaks about Redeemer, somebody who would come and save us from our sins, da, 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 da. But, but I want you to notice they didn't just say his name, they also gave his title. Jesus, Master. The Master has authority over everything. In that moment, they were saying, Master, you have authority over our condition. You have authority over our sickness. You have authority over our leprosy. I want you to know today, He has authority over your family. He has authority over your mind. He has authority over your emotional well being. The God of heaven that we worship is a God who carries great authority. There is nothing bigger. There is nothing too hard. There is nothing too difficult. There is nothing, I, are you hearing me? There is nothing too great. There's nothing too great. So we speak over every person with cancer. Jesus, Master. We speak over people with blood conditions and bone conditions. We say, Jesus, Master. We speak over every person watching live on live stream right now who's suffering something with mental health. We say, Jesus, Master. He has authority. You see, what happens is this, is, is when you begin to declare Him as Lord and Master, then the rules change. Did you hear me? I said the rules change. Because there's, there's, a, there's a natural law of things on this planet. There's a natural order. The sciences tell us about the natural laws, the, the natural things. We understand that, that one thing plus another equals something else. We understand equal and opposite reactions. We understand that because we went to school. Now, let me take you on a spiritual journey and tell you this, that when you invite God into the middle, the laws change. Everything changes. Because where do you think the laws came from in the first place? We, I used to play games with my children when they were really little, and the make-believe games were the hardest games to play. They were the hardest games to play because the kids always changed the rules. So they'd say, Daddy, you have to do this. And then I would do that. And then they would find themselves losing this make-believe game. They'd say, no, you can't do that. You have to do it this way. I said, but this is the law that you said. It's my game. <laughs> the, that's why we pray. I don't know if you came down Thursday night. This place was packed, packed full of, of, of people praying. Pastors and leaders from all over the city, Church of England, Methodist, Baptist, Baptocostal, Pentecostal, every weird expression in between, we were all here praying because prayer changes the game. Prayer changes the rules. Prayer makes you, makes you bring, bring God into the mix. Come here, Elena. Look at this. Look at this. The prayer walls, we started this in January this year. We literally cannot keep up with it. I didn't even know. I kept looking at the prayer walls going, man, there's not many prayer requests and, 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 and praise reports. And then I walked past Mark Steele's desk and I saw, I saw this. Now, pink is answered prayer. Pink is the praise reports. Blue is the prayer requests. Let, let, let me read you some here. Let me read you some here. Why are they so, so messed up? Uh, 
Somebody said here, uh, they managed to get a mortgage and clear an overdraft. It looked impossible. Somebody got a dream job. Somebody says here, uh, I've been through, seen through sickness. Doctors are saying I'm better than they ever thought. My granddad was healed and released from hospital in Botswana. He's healthier than ever. Uh, restored marriage. Come on, somebody, restored marriage. Somebody here says, freedom from anxiety and depression. Oh, this is a nice one. I had cancer, but I don't have cancer anymore. Somebody's thanking God for a restored marriage. You see, something happens when you invite God into the middle. The rules change. The rules change. And folks, let's just stop. Let's just stop abiding by the laws of nature that say, well, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. No, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Have mercy on us. You see, until you've experienced the presence and the power of God, this is weird. But as we've previously discussed, everybody's somebody else's weirdo. True, right? We're changing the rules. Hey, champion. Watch this. When he saw them, Jesus said, go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, I want you to get this, folks. They heard the word and then they did it. Did you get that? Let me tell you what we tend to do. I'm gonna walk down on the, off the stage here. Hopefully it won't feed back. What we do is this. We hear the word, we write it in our journal, and we think about it for weeks and months and years. And then what happens is this. Years later, something happens and you remember the word that God gave you. And you think, well, maybe I should do something about it. So you start to do something about that word weeks and months and years later, and then you end up getting a breakthrough. But what would happen if when you heard the word, hey, guys, that instead of writing it in your journal, your, 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 your prayer journal, and thinking about it forever, what would happen if you actually thought to yourself, you know what, I'm going to do it. I mean, just, just humor me for a moment. Let's just imagine we love God, okay? Just imagine that, that we love God. And just imagine with me that we actually believe that prayer changes things. Like what would happen if we shortened the time between what God said and what we did? And the Bible is really clear. The Bible says that the reason some Christians are sick is because they carry offense to another brother or sister in the faith. Unforgiveness, bitterness, yeah. offense. John Bevere calls it the bait of Satan. And so we go to doctors, we, we pop tablets. What would happen if we just thought, hang on a minute, who am I holding a grudge to? Who's offended me so deep that I just can't do anything about it? What, what would happen, folks? If we actually read the verse, the reason some of you are sick is because you carry unforgiveness and offense. I mean, what would happen if in a moment's time when we opened the altar, some of you just came down here, you could stand, you could get on your knees and say, well, God, you, you, your word says this, so therefore, help me to forgive them. Because the Bible says they heard the word and as they responded, they were cleansed. What are you thinking about? Come on, folks, what are you thinking about? Why, why are we mulling it over and over and over? They say whiskey takes years to make. Gin takes just two days. Why do you be more gin, less whiskey? <laughs> Quote that, baby. Just write that down, it's Instagram moment. 
be more gin, less whiskey. You going to do that? You want to take a picture of me for Instagram for that? You got it? <laughs> be more gin, less whiskey. Jesus said, go show yourselves. As they did it, they were healed. They got a word. So it's, when circumstances seem dark, you just got to get a word. The Bible says your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Hey, listen, if, if stuff tough in business, all you need is a word. Is a relationship gone, gone bad? Folks, get a word. I, I love this because when you're feeling just a little bit blunt, the Bible says the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. I love this because when you're feeling breathless, the word of God is God breathed. When you're feeling out of energy, you feel like you've got no oxygen, just the word of God breathes, breathes into you. you just got to get a word. We, um, we're, we're, this building here, which is, which is a miracle, we moved into this building on a six-month lease, a six-month lease. And um, when we actually signed the papers for the lease initially, we had somewhere in the region of three months to get an empty Staples warehouse ready for Audacious Conference. And um, it reached a point six weeks before the conference where we were still waiting for zoning permission to get this place properly rezoned for, for church worship and, and those sorts of things. And, and we were panicking. Because we're going like we, we've, we're going to have two thousand at that time. Two thousand teenagers are going to rock up for conference, and we've just got a shell. We have six weeks. When I say this was a shell, it's an understatement. It was a bad shell. I mean, it was it just bricks and mortar. That was it. It was nothing else. And it came to a moment where Sparky kind of you know twists my arm behind my back and says, "Mate, what are we going to do?" I said, "I don't know." And I read the Bible that morning. And my Bible reading was from Ezra chapter five. This was my quiet time. And Ezra five says this, Zerubbabel built the walls without permission. (laughs) Now I was a youth pastor in church for a lot of years and I know this, it's easy to get forgiveness and permission. Rang Sparky, said, press go, let's build. He's like, we haven't got permission. I said, it doesn't matter. Let's do it. He's like, okay. Got the builders. The builders came in. The day the builders came in and started, we got an email giving us permission to start the work that we'd started an hour earlier. If you weren't the city council, I'm really sorry. The key was we got a word. And I'm not kidding. We finished the last lick of paint. Conference started the next day. We said to people, don't touch the walls. It's still drying. It's so cool. We, doors were ruined and chairs were, were ruined and chewing gum on the carpet. And, like you just need a word. need to finish. As they went, they were cleansed. As they went, they were cleansed. I love this because they responded with expectation, not preconceived ideas. Expectation is the big picture. Preconceived ideas is the detail. Church, would you look at me for a moment across this place? Please don't allow a preconceived idea ruin a miracle. It happened with Naaman. Naaman had leprosy in the Old Testament. He went to see a man of God and the man of God said, go and dip yourself in that river seven times. He goes, that river's filthy. I refuse to do it. I won't go and do it. And as he's leaving disgruntled, you see, he wanted, he had expectation to be healed, but his preconceived idea said it has to look exactly like this. The slave girl went up to him and said, listen, master, surely this is an easy thing for you to do. So he changed his mind. He went back to the river. He dipped himself seven times. And on the seventh time he came up, the Bible says his leprosy was gone. Naaman, 
He almost lost the miracle because of a preconceived idea. Folks, your miracle may not always look the way you thought it would look, but my encouragement is this. Don't lose the expectation, but just forget about the preconceived idea. Because I promise you, the way God does things is not the way we do things. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has in store for you for this miracle in Jesus' name. They went, they were cleansed. This is a beautiful picture. And then the last passage, I'm just gonna read this, this two verses. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet. He thanked him and he was a Samaritan. Oh, I haven't got time to preach that. Jesus asked, were not all 10 cleansed? Notice Jesus' words, were not all 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? No one was found to return and give praise to God, except this foreigner. Then Jesus said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Did you see that? See, God's got the power, but it's your faith. It's my faith that's key. Faith is really just responding to God. That's what it is. And I don't know what level of miracle you need in your life, but we've got a few moments that we're gonna pray and believe for that. So would you stand to your feet with me across this place?